The reading this morning is taken from Luke, chapter 21, verses 25 to 36, and can be found on page 1057 of the Church Bible. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. He told them this parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourself and know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness and anxieties of life, and that day will close on you suddenly like a trap, for it will come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on the watch, and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen, and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. Um, there's a lot of scripture referenced in, in today's sermon, and um, a lot of you will get an um, email copy later on, so please use that. But if there's paper versions here, for those of you who are not on um, email or on the email list, please help yourself. Perhaps use that for personal study or home groups as well. The last time I preached, I accused you of being weird and um, to continue to do so. I think that struck a chord with quite a few people. However, I suspect that some of you found that you will need to continue to do that. This sermon in the Bible, uh, Bible passage that we just read, does continue to reinforce that weirdness of Christians and our beliefs. And remember that you know, we are not to make God's ways normal. They aren't. And I kind of echoed that last time I stood before you. You know, Isaiah 55 talks about the following. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. In addition, we are asked to no longer conform up not to conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. That's Romans 12. You and I have an important message to communicate, and people's eternal life depends on it. And in a way, that's what this message of today is about. That's a rather long sermon. It'll be about 30 minutes. I'm going to time myself so I don't go any more than that. (laughs) And I'm going to break it up into four parts. Effectively, there are four questions. Why can we be confident that Jesus is going to return? What would the signs of his return be like? The third point is, why is Jesus coming back? You know, what is his purpose? And finally, what is our response to that? So that's the real sort of application part of the sermon. Okay, the first part. Why, why can you and I be confident that Jesus is coming back? And when I first, I've had this scripture for a while. I kind of had been leave, living and breathing Jesus' return for ages. Um, it's actually been quite a difficult one to sort of wrestle with. But when I first read the scripture that was just read out earlier on, um, it, the passage that struck me was, was verse 27, and it said, at that time... They will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And it made me think, you know, who is this Son of Man? 
And what does that phrase, that title mean? Because it's not saying the Son of God at this point. You and I may be familiar with that term, Son of God. But it doesn't say the Son of God will be coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Okay, this title, Son of, Son of Man, was first picked up by Daniel, as in Daniel and the Di- and Lions then. And um, it followed a series of dreams that he had. And Daniel 7 says the following. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like the Son of Man, coming with clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days, which is God, and was led into his presence. He goes on to say, he was given authority, this Son of Man was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All all peoples and nations and men of every language worshipped him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and it will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So here we see that reference to that title, Son of Man. And it talks about this Son of Man coming with clouds of heaven, and who has authority and sovereign power, very much picked up in that passage in Luke. Now, Jesus claims to be that person. In fact, it was that claim that was grounds for the high priests and the Sanhedrin to condemn Jesus worthy of death. And we can see that in Mark 14, 61. They ask, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? As the high priest, I am, said Jesus, and you will see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Critics of Christianity often say that Jesus never claimed to be divine. In fact, that is something that Muslims believe. They are taught that, that Jesus never claimed to be God, to be divine. Well, The Gospel of Mark proves otherwise. So the passage of Mark, together with Daniel, makes it very clear that he does. And we can have confidence in the Gospel of Mark because it's considered to be the major record of the life of Jesus. It was the first Gospel to be written. And it was subsequently used by Matthew and Luke in the drawing of and writing of those Gospels. So you and I can have confidence that Jesus will return. Why? Because he says so himself. And things like the Gospel of Mark, and if you study this, they are eyewitness accounts. Those people were alive when they did their interviews and they recorded those witness statements. They're not kind of made up. You and I can have confidence in the Gospel and confidence that Jesus is returning. This is my little routine. I have to have a drink halfway through it. Okay, so Jesus is coming. How will we know? What are the, what are the signs? Well, Glenn, a couple of weeks ago, spoke about when Jesus was returning or will return. And he and the Bible is very clear This is Mark 14, 32. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Now, Jesus' object in in talking to his disciples about his return, and through them, you and me, was basically to warn us to be prepared. We had a little bit of echo of this in some of the prayers this morning. We need to be prepared. After all, Luke, in that passage, is talking about the fig tree and the trees. And we can kind of spot this in nature. He's talking about springtime leading into summer, so you can see the buds starting to appear. We may see blossom. And so we can kind of think about when is spring coming and summer. Jesus is saying that there will be signs that we should be able to kind of pick up on and be aware of. 
He doesn't want us to be surprised. He wants us to be prepared and ready and watchful. Now, I'm going to make reference to, I'm going to skip to Matthew 24. There's a number of things there which I want to make reference to. I'm not expecting you to read them. There's some notes there. But we we can look at Matthew 24 from verse 4 onwards. And basically, Jesus identifies four basic signs. And if we read it carefully, for each sign, Jesus provides a description, a danger, and a duty. And the first one we may be kind of familiar with is there's an increase in sort of natural disasters in the world. There will be wars and earthquakes and famines. But what makes this a bit more distinct is there's a kind of accumulation of them and they start to happen in quick succession. So we might have each one of those at the moment, but in reality what tends to happen, they are... um, gaps between them and the intensity tends to pick up. So how do people respond during natural disasters, particularly if there are a number of those coming together for a period of time? Well, people tend to feel alarm and they feel a sense of insecurity. They naturally worry, you know, what's the world coming to? And during such a time, People often look for a savior. Well, they look for answers, and they look for saviors. Now, you and I need to be very careful at this point. Now, who are we putting our trust in? Who is our savior? Because the world are going to throw up all sorts of false messiahs. Are we anchored in the Lord Jesus? In fact, Luke Jesus says in the passage of Luke, we, are, we need to lift up our heads at this point. And that's a, that's a kind of a conscious decision. I'm not saying these circumstances are easy. You know, all of our responses are mine as well. is going to be kind of, oh my goodness. We are to lift up our head. And we are not to be alarmed or, or have a anxiety, but a sense of anticipation. The Lord is approaching. He is coming. It's almost like a mother waiting to give birth to her child. There's a sense, and for the father as well, there's a sense of expectation. I want to give birth to a child. Yes, there are kind of labor pains, but the expectation is positive. It's one of looking forward to. So we need to lift up our heads. The next one, the next sign is, this is uh, verse 9 in Matthew 24. There will be desertions in the church. The church, places like Christ church, will be under pressure and we will experience um, opposition. And those people who have kind of very shallow faith and who perhaps don't really know the Lord Jesus are going to find it much more easier to wander off And it may be this will be from a gradual sense of kind of not coming to church as often, not going to home groups, not spending time now in the Word, in the Bible, and praying. If we don't have those kind of rocks in our lives, it's going to be tempting for us to draw away because our foundation's not going to be strong enough. So there will be people who will leave the church and will lose their faith. Some of them to find false messiahs. But bizarrely, when the church is often under pressure, it can also expand. And so we have a responsibility at Christ Church. Are we going to be a preaching church under those circumstances? Are we going to be people who shine? That's a kind of a conscious decision. And when we talk about preaching church, this is not just me and Jackie and Glyn. That is you guys You have a message to preach. You are the light in the world. And people will want answers. The third one, there will be a dictator. This gets towards the end. This is verse 15 of Matthew. 
dictator in the Middle East. The troubles have always, troubles have always inflicted God's people. And this will reach a climax, which will be really, will be short, and it will be sharp. It will be tough. And it's often called the Great Tribulation. And this will be led by a man of lawlessness, which is what uh, Paul talks about in 2 Thessalonians. And he will set himself up as the only God to be worshipped in God's temple in Jerusalem. He will want you to worship him only. In a way, Daniel had already experienced this in the Old Testament, which we picked up earlier on. In fact, we go back to that time and talk about the Romans around Jerusalem. They wanted people to worship Caesar only. So this is kind of not new, but the intensity is going to be pretty tough. Again, you and I are going to be in enormous pressure to conform to the standards of the world. We will be persecuted ruthlessly. We'll talk a solution about this in a minute. It'll be tough. But God will step in. In fact, he cuts the time short. Because otherwise, there'd be none of us left. How does he cut it short? Verse 29 in Matthew, the darkness in the sky. I think there'll be no mistake when this happens. Um, all natural sources of light. So if you can check these, so, so the passages there, don't take my word for it. Read the Bible, okay? I'm quoting all this stuff. This is Matthew 24, verse 29 to 31. All natural sources of life will be extinguished. Light will be extinguished, leaving the whole sky black as ink. And it will be for a prolonged period of time. It won't be hours. It could be days. It could be a week or so. I don't think that there's no time, specific time here. Now, we're not talking about a small geographical area. We're talking about the whole world at this point. That's what Jesus talks about in Matthew. At this point, Jesus returns. And given that Jesus comes during this period of darkness, Jesus, who is the light of the world, there will be no mistake that he has returned. And in a way, that Luke passage talks about the anxiety people will feel at that moment. There's some really tough passages there, really difficult ones, worrying ones. We'll talk about some solutions in a minute, the application. Okay, the third point. Okay, he is coming. Those are the signs. Why is he coming back? Now, some people look forward to the second coming and sometimes death because they want to escape this world of ours and all its hardships and difficulties. They see all the corruption and what has been, what's gone wrong with creation, and they look forward to leaving. They are looking for a lifeboat, as it were, to take them away. And I'm not sure that God sees it this way. I'm not sure that's exactly what the Bible talks about either. Because I think God is a down-to-earth type of God. And the Bible, the whole narrative of the Bible says that. We have a God who created creation. And he said it was good. Just go back to your Genesis, beginning of Genesis. Genesis, we see that he made this world, and it was very good. And he spent time walking in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. And when they were disobedient and sin entered creation, he didn't abandon us. He singled out people like Abraham and Moses to build a nation of priests, in fact, people to be a light in the darkness. What did he do? He traveled with them in the desert and lived amongst them. And when they moved into the promised land, they built a temple and he dwelt amongst them. And later on, he sent his son, Jesus, to tabernacle. I love that phrase, that kind of pitch in his tent 
amongst us. Jesus likes or the, the Lord God Almighty loves tents. <laughs> Go to New Wine. You'll see it. <laughs> You're missing a the tree there. Yeah, Jesus, the son of yeah, the son Jesus tabernacled and dwelt amongst us. And what did he do? He ate and he slept and he cried and he loved and he died for us. He was then resurrected three days and continued to live in his creation. People saw him. The Gospels record these events. And then he ascended to heaven. And was that it? No, he ascended so that the Holy Spirit could descend. So he's back to earth once again. The Spirit of Jesus is with us. This is hardly someone who doesn't care about his creation and our world of our, and this world of ours. He can hardly be it can hardly be called an absentee landlord. The Holy Spirit, regardless of what people think, the Holy Spirit dwells amongst us. Now, are we inviting the Holy Spirit in our life? So what's he going to do when he comes back? Revelation 21, verse 3 onwards. Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And he will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. That is good news. There'll be an ushering in of a new heaven and a new earth, cleansed of sin and evil. The old heaven and earth, sin and death, gives way to a new dominion over which the Lord again rules. God is once again close to us in the days of when he walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. Just think about that. The idea that just like Adam and Eve encountered God, again, the je je beginning of Genesis talks about this, they walked in the garden with the Lord God Almighty. That's what it's going to be like. God's creation will be restored to its original goodness, and it is not an escape from the earth, it's a restoration of God's creation on a new earth. Three major events will usher in this restoration of creation and the arrival of God's kingdom. So, number one, Jesus returns. Number two, the dead are raised bodily. Some to share in the life um, of the new creation and some to receive the final wrath. The world comes before Jesus to be judged. How do we feel about that? Okay, well, Jesus makes, the, Jesus makes a perfect judge. He is both man and he is divine. His humanity gives him understanding. He has lived in our circumstances. He understands our pressures and our temptations He didn't have any advantage when he was here amongst us, when he lived in Jerusalem 2,000 plus years ago. Yet Jesus was without sin. He knows what it's like to be you and I. That's where his compassion comes from. He's also divine, and that gives him knowledge. He knows our every secret sin our careless words, our hidden motives, our deepest emotions. He knows you and me through and through. And his judgment will be absolutely just. 
Again, Revelation 20 talks about, informs us that we will stand before a white throne with Jesus sitting upon it. There, our life will be recorded in books. And for those of a certain generation will know this. It's, there used to be a program many, many years ago called This Is Your Life. But that was a very sugar-coated program. And they used to have a celebrity come, there, come on this program, and they would say, you know, they would talk about the nice little bits that they got up to. It was never the bad bits. Okay. Well, this is not really like that program. It will have everything, the good and the bad, the bits that we don't want other people to know. What verdict can there be for each one of us here in this room? Guilty? Who confronted with such damning evidence could argue with that verdict? Who has always done what they know to be right? Who has avoided everything they have criticized and condemned in others? I often think that things like the sins or things I can point out in others are probably the ones that I know I've got. I think they're always the easiest ones to identify. Romans talks about truly there is no one who consistently does good, not even one. All have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. So is there no hope? Is there no good news? Are we to dread that time of Jesus' Jesus' second coming? Let's go back to Revelation 20, verse 12. Revelation speaks of another book being opened. This is called the Book of Life, or the Lamb's Book of Life. Everyone listed in this book will be acquitted, escaping from the verdict and the sentence of death. Acquitted, we go free. We live for eternity. How do you and I get our name on that book? That should be the thing that we need to think about. You get your name on that book by trusting in Jesus as Savior. They live by faith. They trust and obey God's word. And their deeds were evidence of faith. In essence, the Christian faith is a confession of, I've messed up, I have sinned, I am not perfect, and I need someone's help. That my actions cause pain for others. And it's a confession of that, that I'm not all right, I am not perfect, I've messed up, and I need Jesus' help. It's about repenting and saying sorry and believing that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I need Jesus in my life because he comes between God, me, and God's wrath. That is why Jesus came to earth. This is what God's plan was. Our sins and our wrongdoing have consequences. We have hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have sung many good songs this morning and committed really good prayers. It's a confession that we need the Lord Jesus, that his death on the cross mattered. And we should praise the Lord. We praise the Lord Jesus that he comes between me and the Father's wrath. And and the same for you. We will all need a savior. We need to make sure we've got the right one, the Lord Jesus, as our savior. Right, I've nearly finished. (laughs) So, what's our response? It's a tough sermon. It's very tough. (laughs) 
we need to shine. I'm kind of summarizing this. Our response to Jesus is that we need to shine during this period of waiting and preparation. This is why Jesus has spoken to his disciples in Luke and the other Gospels like Matthew. He's telling us this so we can prepare and not be surprised. And this shining thing is about being cities on a hill, not lights hiding under a bowl, which is Matthew 5. This passage I've just lived with for the last 12 plus months. Right, this shining to be cities on a hill. We need to be like that in terms of, there's two aspects of it. There's a community of faith. One is individually. You and I have to take responsibility for our own holiness and repentance. And Jackie gave an amazing sermon last week about that. It won't be anyone else that stop us from going to heaven. It won't be Donald Trump or your neighbor or your work colleague or whoever we place in between. It will be our own choices and our own response. That's what Jackie was talking about last week. You and I each have an individual responsibility to go on seeking the Lord while he can be found. To turn to the Lord who will freely pardon our sins. It's Isaiah 55. So we need to get our own, we need to get our own self right and lined up, keep short accounts with the Lord, confessing, receiving his forgiveness. Not to wander off and get distracted. The other thing is about a church. We need to, Christ church needs to shine. And we need to make sure we do not isolate isolate ourselves from each other. And that's really easy to do. I don't feel like going to church today. Going to home group. I'm busy. I'm not reading my Bible. We need to surround ourselves with each other. I need your help in keeping on track. And you need each other as well. That's why community of faith is so important. Chris often talks about you know, like a coal falling out of a, hot, uh, a fireplace that calls, needs to be back into the fireplace. We need each other. That's why we need to be loving towards each other and taking care. And when, people, when we, at various times, we fall out of the fireplace, that people come back and say, Dean, where are you? What are you doing? I notice you haven't attended home group for a couple of weeks. How's it going? About praying for one another, loving one another. I'm not sure we can do all this by ourselves. Well, we're not supposed to do it by ourselves. Let us not give up meeting together as we are in the habit of doing but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day of judgment approaching. That's how we get through this. Encouraging, loving one another, lining ourselves up with the Lord, praying, asking his help. The other part of being a city on a hill and not a bowl, a light under a bowl, is about those around us. And this is really, I have two kind of real big issues, not going to say issues, concerns. One is that I hang on to my faith, not that I don't believe or anything like that. I'm not sure I always trust myself to hang on, which is why I need you guys. That's why we need each other. But what about those who do not know the Lord Jesus at this moment. That's one of my big concerns. What about my friends and and some of my family who don't know the Lord? What about my work colleagues and the people I walk past each day? Now, do they have people who are looking out for them, who pray for them, who can shine and witness to them?
strongly believe that a wrongful response to Jesus' return is selfish rejoicing. That, ah, oh, I'm, I'm all right. It'd be like me saying, oh, I think I'm all right. My name's on that book. Hooray! I'm sorted. I've got no problems. I believe in Jesus. I confess. I know I receive forgiveness. And then I just kind of keep that for myself. That kind of selfish rejoicing, I don't think it's... I don't think it's about that. Yes, that is good and it's important. Each one of us has been saved. But in a way, we're like a burning wick snatched out of a fire. We'll probably be smoky when uh, Jesus comes because we'll be saved. But we'll be saved because of Jesus. You know, we have a duty and a responsibility to share what Jesus has freely given us. We are saved by faith. And we need to continue to be weird for the sake of the world.